grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is from our gospel lesson. I read again Luke 10, verse 2. And Jesus said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Here is the reading of our text. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. As I grew up, and many of our more seasoned uh, members may have this memory also, our congregation had mission festivals. We would invite some missionary who was home on sabbatical, and he would tell us stories from his time in the mission field. These men worked in such exotic places like Africa and Asia. Often they brought and displayed memorabilia from their time in the mission field so we could see authentic items from that area of the world. We also typically had a potluck meal that featured foods that represented that particular mission field, though in retrospective, I don't know how authentic our dishes were. <laughs> um, Naturally, an offering was taken up to support the missionary as he labored, further labored in the field to bring Christ to the remotest parts of the world. The text for that sermon of that day, more often than not, was our text for today. One of the hymns that we would inevitably sing would be from Greenland's Icy Mountains by Lowell Mason. The hymn was written in 1824, which was during the height of the Western Church's passion for foreign missions. We no longer sing that hymn. In fact, it's not even in our new hymnal. My guess is that it was left out for at least two reasons. First, it just isn't politically correct anymore to call non-Christian heathens and stuff like that, which are in, in that hymn. Second, to be honest, it just isn't true anymore, if it ever was. If you go through the verses of that hymn, you see that it assumes everybody in the Western world, you know, Europe and the United States, are all Christian. And every person in places like Africa and Asia are not. The reality is that today, Africa has more Christians than either the United States or Europe. In fact, Africa has the world's largest Lutheran denomination. Not any of those Scandinavian countries, Africa. I might also observe that while I certainly share the sentiment of the earlier generations and think that foreign mission works needs to be supported and encouraged, and lifted up for all of us, our text is poorly chosen for a foreign missions push. Today's text is actually better suited for what used to be called home missions, or if you prefer the modern phrase, evangelism. Now think about it for a minute. Where were these 72 going? Verse 1 reads, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. These missionaries were not going to the Gupta Empire over in India, the Qi Dynasty in China, the Bantu tribes down in Africa, or even the mighty cities of Rome and Constantinople. You can forget about them going to places like North or South America. These missionaries were headed to places in and around the Jewish territories near the eastern portion of the Mediterranean Sea. The Great Commission in Matthew 28 is far better suited for a foreign missions appeal. This one today is for home missions. The need for home mission in the United States has always been real. While many came to our shores to escape 
religious persecution, like the forefathers of our denomination, many others came to escape religion altogether. When the Missouri Senate was founded back in the 1800s, it made sense for a lot of reasons to place our headquarters in St. Louis, Missouri. After all, that's where our publishing house was already incorporated and established. One of those reasons, though, is that the city had a huge German population and we were a German-speaking church. In fact, there were so many Germans there that over half of the newspapers published in St. Louis were in the German language. So you would think it'd be a great uh, seating ground for a German-speaking Missouri Senate Lutheran church, right? But over half of those German newspapers were either, were, they were anti-clerical, anti-church, and in general, anti-religion. Things have changed. They, they were not looking for a church home. But things changed in the U.S. as every denomination realized that our nation was basically unchurched and set about reaching the locals' home mission for Christ. You might be surprised to know that the greatest generation, which is the generation my parents were part of, uh, was the most churched generation in America ever. Not the first generation with George Washington and those guys, but the greatest generation. But those days are past because the greatest generation failed to hand the faith off to the next generation, my generation. I once called our new day and age the neo-pagan age. And that is because my generation and the younger ones, you know, X, Y, Z, whatever, X prime, whatever they want to call them, uh, have lost, turned our back on Christ and his church. And we've become self-absorbed and we have a lifestyle and a belief system that leaves little room for Jesus. But then instead of calling it neo-pagan, I heard a, a much better uh, label suggested by our district president, the New Missionary Age. That's a much more positive name, don't you think? <laughs> you know. But whatever you call our current time, the name Christian does not fit. On June 25th of this year, the Wall Street Journal published an article titled Cradles, Pews, and Shifting Politics. In it, they reported on a survey that indicated that only 29% of Americans say that they attend a worship service about uh, once a week. At the same time, 26% of Americans indicated that they never attend worship service at all throughout the year. Now that number is actually a bit misleading for Christians because it includes Jews who obviously attend worship services, Muslims, Mormons, and so forth, Hindus, even, even members of Uncle Bob, Bob's Temple of Light, Truth, and Healing by the gas station anybody would qualify. If you just want to count people who attend a traditional Christian worship service, and now I'm not commenting about what comes out of the uh, pulpit actually, but only denominations that have a history of being committed to Christ, then the weekly attendees in America drops to 20%. This group includes all denominations labeled Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopalian, Roman Catholic, Baptist, Presbyterian, and so on. All that are historically Christian, no matter where they are right now. We are indeed then living in a new missionary age, and the mission field is right outside our front doors. As Jesus said, 
when he was sending the 72 out as home missionaries, the harvest is plentiful. Everywhere you look, there are people who do not believe in Jesus. Next time you are in the mall or somewhere else where there's a lot of people, you might want to try this little exercise. As you're walking down the, the mall breezeway, every, every time you pass somebody, for the first four people, say to your mind, in your mind, going to hell. And then on the fifth one, say, going to heaven. And then four more, going to hell. And on the fifth one, going to heaven. Or maybe if you walk your neighborhood, do that as you're passing everybody's house. You know, going to hell, going to hell, going to hell, going to hell. Ah, at last, going to heaven. Ah, going to If you do this little exercise, perhaps it will just drive home in our minds how serious the problem is in the United States. Of course, it's simplistic. Not everyone who attends a Christian worship service is uh, or has faith in Jesus. And not everyone who is not in church has rejected Christ. For example, there are plenty of homebound people who are faithfully visited by their pastor, but who never get to church because they're homebound. But the labels going to hell and going to heaven are accurate enough though may be jarring to modern sensibilities. The truth that only faith in Christ justifies and that outside of Christ there is only sin and darkness, death and damnation, is not now and never has been a welcome truth in non-Christian circles. I dare you to find an Orthodox Jew, a committed Muslim, or a hardcore atheist that believes and agrees with the statement that there is salvation in no one else except Jesus, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. The most common response of the unchurched is to be deeply offended. The words of Je in Jesus' lesson today then continue to ring true. Go your way, Behold, I'm sending you out as lambs among the wolves. That doesn't sound like Jesus is expecting us to get a positive response. It's not a warm and fuzzy thing. Of course, when we hear this text preached at a mission festival, the accent is often not on the warning of Jesus, but on the results the disciples experienced. They said, Lord! Even the demons are subject to us in your name. That seemed to be the apex of their experience and covered the less dramatic results that they, often, that they were often welcomed. Jesus was, after all, a celebrity, and people were often happy and excited when his advanced team came to announce his impending visit. But the gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, is often not welcome. This was true in Jesus' own lifetime. So he said in our reading, Woe to you, Chorazon! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. Capernaum, Bethsaida, and apparently Chorazon were towns that Jesus had visited, preached in their synagogues, and healed people. But ultimately, they rejected Jesus. Tyre and Sidon were mighty Old Testament pagan cities. Tyre had friendly relationship with Israel during the reigns of King David and King Solomon, but ultimately rejected the true God and was destroyed. Though Sidon saw all the Lord did in establishing Israel in the Promised Land, 
they also rejected the true God and became a snare to the Israelites. Ultimately, Sidon was destroyed. It took many years before the judgment came upon these Old Testament cities, but it came. Those who rejected Christ are finally brought down to Hades. The 72 went to their neighbors with a dual call. They were instructed to heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick is basically a reference to acts of mercy, which, based on the report they give at the end there, uh, included delivering people from uh, demons. But it also included all general acts of Christian charity. There is also a gospel word here, part of this mission. The kingdom of heaven comes with Christ. Notice that Jesus has them say, the kingdom of God has come near to you, and not you have come to the kingdom of God. That is because the kingdom comes by pure grace. Christ comes to us through word and sacrament. The greatest blessing these 72 had received was that their names were written in heaven. This is always the ultimate blessing. This is what being in the kingdom of God grants. Sharing this with their neighbors is what the mission of the 72 is all about. Proclaiming Jesus. The dual-edged message, the message of warning concerning hell and promise concerning heaven, a message that is reflected in both how we speak and how we live, is clearly seen in our epistle lesson. Paul wrote, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever is so, one sows, that will he also reap. And the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary in doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity... Let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. How important is Christ in that message? Hmm? Well, Paul tells us that also. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is central. Home missions. That is what our text is actually about. It is not a call to reach across the ocean but next door with the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There are other texts for home missions and deserve to be heard also. You know, if I could save that mission hymn from Greenland's icy mountains, from the obscurity that hit and slip, I would do so. Because actually, I really like it. But it would have to have a fifth verse added. Something like, to Europe's shores so jaded, America so proud, our God ignored or hated, our own works are avowed. To those who are our neighbors and all across the, our land, they also need the Savior who died that they might stand. Amen. May the peace of God which passes human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.